Welcome back to page 121. Today we're going to take a look at what the Vargir were doing during the Rebellion. This is from the Mega Traveler Rebellion source book uh, from Game Designers Workshop. I love this book. If you've been following this series, I'm taking a look at each faction as they've gone through the Rebellion. I'm getting close to the end. I've got, I think, uh, three after this. So today we're going to take a look at the Vargir. What were the Space Puppies doing while the Imperium was falling apart? Plundering? Yes! But there was something else going on within their society, and we'll touch on that as we go through. Also, real quick, uh, please subscribe if you haven't already. Anybody who has, thank you. And Patreon, please take a look at uh, anything on Patreon that you could do to help me out. I'm trying to grow the channel in a couple other ways, and I need a little help to do that. That's it. End of commercial. Back to the important things. Out of the Rebellion source book, what were the Vargir doing as the Imperium fell apart? Today on page 121. So today, from the Re Rebellion source book, this was out in 1987. This is our first real good look. Sorry, 88. This is our first real good look at everything going on in the Rebellion in Mega Traveler. So today we're going to take a look at the Vargir. I realize that I'm saying Vargir. I also heard pronounced Vargir or Vargir. Uh, I just always said Vargir when it was just the word in my head uh, and at the table. So sorry if you pronounce it another way, but... Right now, I'm going to go with Vargir. So, long ago, shrouded deep in the mists of prehistoric time, the ancients plucked samples of hundreds of worlds. From Terra, they selected humans and carried them to world after world as slaves, specimens, or companions. They also, so, also selected canines from Terra and carried them to one world. On Lair, the ancient genetic experiments produced the Vargir, upright, bipedal, intelligent carnivores with visible origins as dogs, or wolves, depending on which version of travel you're talking about. Uh, over hundreds of years, Vargir matured and evolved to settle and exploit their world. Then, in minus 3810, they discovered jump drive and burst out into their neighboring systems. Uh, over the course of the next 2,000 years, Vargir expanded into hundreds of systems, settling virgin worlds and sacking settled ones. The key to understanding Vargir is a single aspect of their psychology. They are driven in many aspects by a pack mentality. Vargir are gregarious people, taking joy in the company of one another, and seeking the security and comfort of fellowship with others of their own kind. Yet at the same time, Vargir within a group are engaged in a nearly constant struggle for prestige and dominance. To an outside observer, Vargir often appear quarrelsome and even treacherous. Vargir move from one group or association to another with great regularity. All of Vargir's society is subject to twin forces. A centrifugal force brings small groups together and makes them more cohesive, and a centripetal force pushing the group apart. All of Vargir's society is constantly pushed and pulled by these twin forces. So the Vargir live by their ancient drive of pack mentality. Uh, you have much better chance to survive in a pack. Uh, so you band together in a pack for necessity. But once within the pack, you then are constantly jockeying for better position, uh, better scraps, better food, uh, better everything. So that's the Vargir mentality. It's kind of interesting. It's been carried on to, into space, if you will. And then we go to the Imperial Vargir border. Vargir worlds are situated all along the Imperial Corwood border. Stretching 200 parsecs across six se sectors, the border requires constant monitoring in order to keep the Imperial territory secure. Imperial fleets constantly patrol the border systems to deter Vargir Corsairs. Punitive raids reinforce the concept that invasions of Imperial territory are unacceptable. Constant vigilance maintains the safety of trade and also the Imperial citizens. Yet, Vargir Corsairs continue to cross the border in search of plunder. Successful Vargir raiders also gain an, an intangible benefit. They find a reputation which enhances their standing with other Vargir. So they get higher in the uh, pack order. Uh, long ago, Imperial researchers concluded that the unification of the Vargir under one later, leader would be a strict impossibility. There could never be total agreement of Vargir as to a single leader. Whenever leaders reach high levels of power, rivals bring them down and their followers drift away to follow others. Within the last several decades, however, a new face has appeared among the Vargir, and acceptance of his leadership has grown to unprecedented proportions. The beginnings of this. Narsnyarg Ong, roughly translated the Electronics Corporation of Lair, built an extensive market for products without, throughout Vargir space by importing innovative novelty electronics from high-tech worlds. These products, which did well, were then copied and produced uh, more cost-effectively cheap locally. 
when the concepts were copied, they were modified so they would suit Vargir specifically. Sound systems were more attuned to the Vargir ear, colors to the Vargir eye. Over time, the Electronics Corporation <laughs> has expanded its electronic formats, such as computers, holographic recordings, broadcast, and beamcast transmissions, and even the production of entertainment and educational materials. The Electronics Corporation's entertainment subsidiary, Naux, is widely known to merchants in Vargir's sp space as a quality producer. However, customers themselves rarely pay any attention to the producer, buying instead on the basis of the entertainer. In 1090, the Electronics Corporation introduced Udivog, Window to the Universe, which was initially perceived by the Imperium as a fancy programmable hollow projector viewer. The device, though a quick, through a quick on-screen survey, determines an array of personality factors about the viewer and tailors the presentation directly to the viewer. For one viewer, the system might tint the background red. For another device, might insert low-frequency harmonics. When properly set to a viewer's configuration, the system produces a much higher level of entertainment and satisfaction than do other hollow viewers, even if the individual cannot verbalize why. So they, they basically incorporate all these uh, things that you don't perceive on a conscious level and to make you enjoy it on, on a lower consciousness level and not even realize that that's what's doing it. So it, your entertainer becomes more entertaining. But the problem is that if multiple people or Vargir are viewing in uh, one sitting, it might be different uh, for each uh, experience. And then humans, of course, of course, find the device hollow in its presentation. The nuances of Vargir verbal and body language make the presentation opaque to most humans, and the tailored personality factors that appeal to Vargir are totally lost on humans. In about 1102, Naugsnarg responded to market research which showed that more and more Utovogs were used for musical entertainment. The tailored personality factors made it possible for sing, uh, single musical presentation to appeal to a wide variety of musical tastes. Positive market response to this respond, uh, prompted them to research an alternative use for the uh, device. One research project analyzed the detailed personality factors that were input and looked at the what the customers wanted. Researchers synthesized a musical personality which would easily trigger the greatest number of responses in customers. Actually, they synthesized several. One to appeal to mature individuals, one to appeal to juveniles, one to appeal to young adults. In fact, one to appeal to every major marketing group within Vargir society. Recordings of each hit the market about 1110. That these new musical stars with synthetic personality was not widely known. For marketing purposes, a mystique was created around each one with details and background that created the illusion of reality for the viewer. That's very similar to the Hollywood, uh, the big studio system in Hollywood in use in the 30s and 40s and 50s, where they would actually come up with this background for the various stars and they would actually get to the point where they would they have this star marry this star just because it, publicly they presented a very attractive couple. That's not myth. That is actually something that went on. The most popular of these synthetic personalities was Oixos. He conveyed a very strong charisma which inspired loyalty and allegiance among his viewers. Few realized he was synthetic. Most of his fans were inspired by the way his music touched their emotions and their intellects. And that effectively blinded them to seeing his synthetic nature. Oixos, being synthetic, is manipulated by his manager and a team of electronic assistants, or scientists. They determine what subject matter his material will deal with. Recently, they found an explosive subject that markets better than any previous one, anti-imperial tirades. Oixos' first tirade reached the top of the market charts immediately and stayed there for months. His second tirade sold even better. Other synthetic personalities joined in and produced their own tirade. Oixos' tirade sparked some attacks on the Imperium. Uh, the company provided the primary entertainment on the starships, and it was natural to expect that some crews would respond to an anti-imperial tirade by raiding imperial territory. Imperial responses were swift and strong, and the Vargir raids were nothing more than nuisance until the rebellion. The rebellion within the Imperium crippled its ability to resist the Vargir. Fleets withdrawn from the frontier made it possible for Vargir to raid with relative impunity. Oixos and others... Tirades against the Imperium continue to spark raids across Imperial territory. Oexos the leader. If there's anyone who could be considered a single leader for the Vargir, it has to be Oexos. The fact that he's tailored to create favorable responses in individuals makes him a sympathetic, charismatic leader where each individually feels 
allegiance to him. In addition, as a recorded presentation, Oaxos is a remote figure who does not actively interfere in the individual's daily life. Each individual Vargir is able to accept and respect Oaxos as a leader without that leadership interfering with ordinary relationships. That's an interesting dichotomy there. Oaxos leadership extends across governmental lines. Governments recognize that he provides no direct competition to their own authority, and so he is no threat to them. Oaxos is, in reality, the only kind of leader that the Vargir will accept on a broad scale, a rallying point to which they can respond. And by a curious twist of fate, the chaos in the Imperium has given a focus against which Vargir attention can be pointed. And their ideal ideology is plunder. The Vargir have no real ideology with which to support their actions. Many explanations and justifications can be presented for their actions, but all are fluff to cover the basic pack instincts of the Vargir. Given a leader and a target, Vargir will seek it out. And here we have a nice little Vargir image right there, the little black skull, and then the, the little blurb is Vargir raiding bands, both private and governmental, have invaded coreward sectors of the imperial border. So pretty interesting. I, I remember reading this back in the 80s uh, and making this grand plan where I was going to introduce Oexos and maybe have the players be the ones that kind of pull back the curtain and, and show the man behind the Wizard of Oz. But I never got around to it. I never did that campaign. However, there's absolutely nothing to stop me from doing it now. I like the idea of uh, having that pay no attention to that man behind the curtain moment in Traveler where the, the, a small group of players, for whatever reason you've gotten them into it, can be the ones to show that Oasis is just this uh, manipulation uh, on a grand scale through electronic media. So I thought that was pretty interesting. I think this is... Uh, Neat that they didn't just have the Vargir just plunder. They gave us kind of a, a better cohesive reason why the Vargir are plundering during the uh, the turmoil in the Third Imperium. But I also like the idea that I can go ahead and introduce this into any campaign that has a decent-sized uh, population of Vargir and uh, go forward with it as uh, something that the players can actually get involved with and maybe an overarching story where they pull back the curtain. So we'll see. That's just a thought. So that's all I've got to say today about this faction of the Rebellion. Uh, I've got a few more of these left in the series. Let me know what you think. I hope you've been enjoying it. I have. This has been a labor of love for me. I have a, a very strong affection for Mega Traveler and the Rebellion era simply because it, it hit at a really fun time in my life, and it's a, a lot of fun to go back to these memories. I, I really enjoyed these books when they came out, and I'm still enjoying them today. So that's all I've got to say today on page 121. Thanks for your time. Thanks for watching. Please leave a comment. And like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.